Okay, welcome everybody. Thanks for joining us. This is the second to last week in our spring uh, 2022 seminar series. I'm Andy Miller. I coordinate the seminar uh, series for the department. I'm going to share screen for just a moment to show you uh, the last two weeks in the series, including today's seminar. So uh, this is today's seminar. Uh, you're going to hear more about that in a moment. And then next week, our final seminar uh, for the current academic year is Dr. Kamala Hawthorne from UC Santa Cruz, who's going to be talking about contesting race and citizenship in the Black Mediterranean. And um, I will remind everybody, uh, if you're interested in watching any of these seminars um, that you may not have seen and you're interested, uh, they are all posted on the website of the Center for Social Science Scholarship. If anybody needs more information about how to reach those, you can just um, email me at U Miller at umbc.edu. So I'm going to stop sharing screen and I'm going to introduce our speaker. Laura Fowler is a mediator, attorney, and law faculty member who focuses on water, energy, agriculture, and dispute resolution. Prior to joining Penn State in 2012, she worked on public policy issues for the Oregon Water Resources Department, attended the University of Washington School of Law, and practiced with Gordon Thomas Honeywell LLP from its Seattle, Washington office. As a private practitioner, she helped facilitate discussions on how to address chronic flooding issues in um, Washington State's second largest river basin, mediated challenging water issues in California and Oregon, and counseled private clients on various regulatory matters, both water and energy related. She was a visiting Fulbright Scholar at Uppsala University during the 2019 to 2020 uh, academic year. And her Fulbright research focused on finding and understanding examples of where cooperation over managing water resources have played out. She now holds a joint appointment as a senior lecturer at Penn State Law and the assistant director for outreach and engagement with Penn State's Institutes of Energy and Environment. She teaches water law, energy law, negotiation and dispute resolution design, and mediation of environmental and public conflicts. And through her mediation and negotiation classes, her students have worked with local governments to host forums on water resources, developing a climate action and adaptation plan for the Center County Council of Governments and conducting situation of analysis of issues like management of stormwater or single use plastics. I just wanna add a personal note because I've come to know Lara over the last several years working together on um, the executive board of the uh, Chesapeake Bay Program Scientific and Technical Advisory Committee. And I've come to really appreciate Lara's ability to frame a question and identify the key issues that need to be resolved. And she has real skill as a mediator. And I think that's gonna be a major element of what she's gonna to talk to you about today. So I'm very pleased to welcome Laura to speak to us this afternoon. Laura, um, take it away, um, the floor is yours. Great, thanks Andy, and thanks for that introduction. Um, I appreciate everybody's time. I know that people's schedules seem um, absurdly busy all the way around, uh, so I appreciate you joining. I have one key and core rule um, that I give to my students and to everybody else, which is there are no dumb questions. So if you have questions as I'm going through, I've got the chat open. Um, I will keep an eye on that, but I, I welcome this as a dialogue and a discussion too, as much as anything. I will share a screen here in a minute, but what I wanted to, to talk about was give just a little bit of background on, on the work that I've done, some of what I think about in terms of frameworks for um, how to handle complex, wicked problems, um, various disputes, and then give a little bit more on some of the research projects that I've been working on lately, again, where we're really trying to bridge uh, science, law, policy, and kind of how we get things done. So let me share my screen, make sure I'm sharing the right thing. Andy, can you see the full screen again? Yes. Great. Um, so I, I had forgotten that I, I liked this phrase until I was talking, I think, with Andy recently, and I was like, how about this for a title? Um, that I have always actually spent most of my career working in the valley of death, uh, where, where good ideas go to die and people get stuck on stuff. Um, you know, and there's often a lot of challenges between a, a solution and an idea and how it's implemented. This is just one schematic. This is the process of technological innovation, right? Where you may have an idea that's funded by a government or somebody else or a research lab, and then you wanna implement it, you wanna translate it, and it gets stuck somewhere. I would say that th the same is true for, hey, I'm working in a complex area, like how do I fix flooding in a river basin? Or how do you address water quality concerns of Chesapeake Bay? Lots of ideas, lots of science, lots of research, but then how do you actually implement that ends up being a very significant uh, set of challenges, and it's a people question. 
Um, I, I sit through lots and lots and lots of conversations with people about water and fish and energy and birds and you name it. And it comes back to how are we as humans actually engaging? So some of it is is uh, is behavior. Uh, it's um, you know thinking about the human side of this to bridge that valley of death. Um, so this gap exists in lots of different ways. Again, you know, critical challenges and potential solutions. I worked on questions like, and I, I'm going to give you a couple case studies from this. Who gets to store and use groundwater in the greater Los Angeles area? How do you fix flooding in Washington's second larger river basin? And those are the two case studies I'll walk through today. How do you meet in-stream flow needs and municipal growth when all the water in an area has been allocated to agriculture for 100 or more years? Um, how do you manage practices for water quality in Pennsylvania? Uh, this is a really hot, hot topic right now for some obvious reasons. Uh, and it's certainly of interest to Maryland, Virginia, and other partners across the, the Bay, uh, Bay watershed. But again, it's, it's a people question. This is a picture of partner and colleagues uh, in Washington State where we're out on a tour talking about how do we fix flooding in the Chehalis River Basin? How do we do stream restoration work? The bottom picture is from Pennsylvania and it's uh, tree planting and buffers. And just to make obvious what I'm trying to do is I often try and really include pictures of people <laughs> in, in the slides that I'm doing, because again, this is not just about water or trees. It is about our engagement with all of the above. Um, so let's see, disputes and conflicts often come up quite a bit. Um, and I guess one of the, one of the questions that I would raise is, um, you know, when you think about a dispute or a conflict, what comes to mind? Um, are there key questions that you, know, how do you react to conflict? And I'm actually going to ask you to use chat, um, and, and respond to that. So my question is, when you think of conflict, what comes to mind? What's a, what's a positive or a negative? Let's see if I can actually stop share so I can uh, pause the share so I can see a little bit more clearly. Uh, Laura, I just need to let you know, I, for some reason, cannot see the chat or the participant list right now. I'm trying to get that back. So okay. uh, you may have to actually read stuff in the chat until I figure out how to get it back. Okay. Uh, I, I have from somebody, I run away. Somebody else says the same. Uh, somebody says I backstep, sidestep, or reapproach. How else do you guys handle conflict? It could be personal, it could be work related, family related. Family related is actually the hardest sometimes. Sometimes it's necessary conflict. Okay, it's not always a bad thing. Uh, try to be more informed on an issue. What else? How else do you guys respond to conflicts? I ask my students this at the beginning of teaching them negotiation, then I ask them at the end, and it's interesting to hear the response. When I can't avoid it, I discuss it. Okay. Try to see where everyone's coming from, ask questions, try and engage. So I want you to think about it and try to appeal to common values. Um, this is something when I'm working with my students on negotiation in particular, I actually really ask them to think about there's no right or wrong. There's just our own personal response to a lot of these things and to try and be more aware. Uh, and one of the, I think one of the key points that I would give you is that active listening and asking questions actually are really, really valuable. And our students actually can be a phenomenal asset to this because they're not as threatening. As some of the rest of us are. Um, I actually got my start working on water issues when I was a 17 year old student and I've been working on it ever since. Uh, and I found I could talk my way into a lot of rooms with people because I didn't represent anybody. Uh, I was curious and just started to, to, to follow up and follow up on threads and people would be like, well, come on in. I'm having a discussion with so and so. Let me tell you, you know, kind of what we're thinking about with things. Uh, somebody else noted if feelings are hurt, people tend to respond more negatively. So try and avoid hurt feelings. Uh, and that's hard right now, particularly in this day and age where there's lots and lots of hurt feelings and a lot of polarization. Um, the other thing that I would give you is that my moments of despair uh, about the state of the world I actually can can temper myself a little bit by thinking back to some of the projects I've worked on to, to say, actually, if you can set up the right situation for people to constructively engage. It allows them to come out of their corners and have more constructive dialogue and, and find solutions to what are really, really challenging problems. So let me go back to sharing here a little bit. I'm gonna give some quick frameworks here. Um, you know, a conflict may be a contest between competing interests, facts, ideas, or values, or people. You gave me some of those words already. Um, you know, is it harmful or is it helpful? The Chinese word for conflict is both danger and opportunity. 
right? And I think people tend to shy away from conflict thinking, oh, it's danger, but is it indeed opportunity to rethink and to reshape what we're actually dealing with? Uh, a colleague who writes in the dispute resolution world says, the sign of a healthy productive relationship is not necessarily the absence of disputes, but it's really about how we handle them. What's our skill for actually approaching them? Um, so let me give you a handful of frameworks. Um, one of my favorite authors is Eleanor Ostrom. She really thinks a lot about um, design principles for working on common pool of resources like water. And I happened, I didn't really know about her work until I was working actually in the in the groundwater basins in Los Angeles, where she did her PhD work. And people are like, do you know about Eleanor Ostrom? I'm like, no, I'm just here mediating, but starting to realize that I was working in the same area, but 30 or 40 years later, which is really cool. Um, but she basically says, look, if you can figure out some clearly defined boundaries that you're working with, think about the congruence of what you're trying to manage, right? Are there a proportional equivalence of benefits or costs? Are there rules restricting time, place, technology, and or quantity related to the local conditions of what you're trying to manage? Have you figured out some way that collectively people can make a choice about what they're doing, monitor the outcome, and if something goes wrong, you graduate those sanctions over time? Have you built in conflict resolution mechanisms? I'm doing a lot of work right now looking at transboundary water organizations and the conflict resolution mechanisms built in. And if you proactively think about that, it really can make a difference. Recognize that people have the right to organize and that there may be nests of layers. Um, you know, we think a lot in this world about individual to community to regional to state to national to international, right? And how do you organize all the way within that? lots of local governments here in Pennsylvania uh, and how to handle that sort of multiple layer and effect is really critical. Um, engagement can be really helpful. I'm a lawyer, I admit it, uh, sometimes I admit it. Um, I periodically wonder why they let a lawyer on the scientific and technical advisory committee and I'm assured that I also fit as a social scientist, which is probably a good thing. Um, but I think hard about negotiated outcomes and I haven't yet done this study, but I would love to do a study that looks at the cost of litigating a lot of our environment and natural resource questions versus the cost uh, and cost not only in terms of money, but in terms of trust and other things of, of negotiating outcomes that people can live with. Um, you know, there's a dispute resolution continuum of from negotiation all the way to somebody else is deciding something. I have always worked on the left side of this where the parties are deciding the outcome. So working as a negotiator, a facilitator, a mediator, where I'm not making the decision for somebody, I am working with them. And the tool of the trade really is questions and guidance, very actively engaging, but I'm not the decision maker. I'm not the arbitrator, I'm not the judge, I'm not the jury. Um, and it tends to be more cooperative and facilitative. It can lower the costs. And what I really like is that it gives you more certainty over the outcome of the process and the solution, and then the implementation, again, to help bridge that valley of death and actually get accomplished what you might want accomplished. Um, thinking about effective processes is something we tend not to do as well as I wish we did. You know, convening, who are the potential parties and stakeholders? That can be usually quite a broad list of people. What are the topics that worry people? I'll often interview people and say, what keeps you awake at night? And as a facilitator, or particularly as a mediator, protected by a mediation privilege, I've been told things that people are like, I've never told this to anybody else. This is really what is concerning to me. The potential for mediation or facilitation, you know, I'm looking for, is there an opportunity? Is it ripe enough to have a conversation? Or are people so fighting on the principle of the thing that they can't even start to have a conversation? Um, Clarifying responsibility. Who has a role or responsibility to create an idea? What are the ground rules? What's my role as a neutral? And what's the process to get from point A to point B? How do parties exchange information and deliberate, explore alternatives and gather resources? It often takes quite a bit of time and effort to create a safe enough space for creative problem solving. And then how do you actually help people implement something and an idea? Uh, what, what, what might you need for an agreement? Who needs to review a proposal to reach an agreement and again start to see that implementation i mentioned i use students for this this is a picture of some of my students in 2018 um, we had a discussion here in uh, the spring creek watershed in central pennsylvania that people really wanted to have a conversation about what's the future of our water resources in this area and i worked all semester with my students to train them up and then host a facilitated discussion with 120 of our closest friends and afterwards, people were like, this is awesome because we had a chance to really talk about what was really important to us. 
Um, it was also somewhat fraught because at the time Nestle as a, uh, had proposed a bottled water plant in the area. And so we were navigating that in real time as we were setting this up. Nestle actually announced on Monday of the week that we were having this discussion on Wednesday that they had decided not to pursue the bottled water plant. And so it was also pivoting in real time because we had thought we were going to be dealing with a conflicting situation when it became, hmm, what's our future look like for this area? Uh, I'm going to give you a really simple diagram. Uh, people really often want to be talking about a topic, substantive question. How do we fix water quality in a particular area? But they forget, again, that there is a people side of it. There's a relationship side of it. We've all had this situation, I think, where somebody walks into the room, they start talking and you stop listening because of who it is. Certainly has happened to me where you just can't hear what somebody is saying, even if it's a good idea because you don't like them. Uh, or the process, and the process may have gone wrong. So I spend a lot of my time thinking about the people and the relationships and the process to create an opportunity for allowing people to move forward. A uh, lot of questions in agriculture or water where there's interests, histories, values, all sorts of context in play. When I teach water law, for example, we spend a ton of time talking about history. I think my poor students are like, I didn't think I was taking a history class. I thought I was taking a law class. But you can't unpack some of this without understanding some of the dynamics that led us to where we are. And then you got to figure out a process for going forward. Uh, people tend to focus on positions versus interests. Uh, I've been watching the, the discussion about COVID, um, management of COVID and masks. Uh, and the de debate goes something like, masks are good, masks are bad. It's a good example of positionality. And it's really hard to have a functional conversation about this. Classic book in the world of negotiation is a book by Fisher and Urey called Getting to Yes. And they basically talk about positions versus interests. The interest may be the values behind something. Why is somebody motivated to do something? The other thing that'll often happen in a room is people will come in and say, I don't want something. I don't want this. I'm going to block this. If you're working with people to try and get to well, what do you want? Well, I don't know. I just don't want that. Uh, and I think all of us can hear those conversations that take place. So an example, and again, I'll, I'll dig into this a little bit more in the Chehalis River Basin, massive, massive flood in 2007. And the positions were, uh, we got to build a dam. It's going to stop the flooding. Or give me dynamite and I will blow up the Mellon Street Bridge and that will stop the flooding. Well, I don't want a dam built. Those are positionality uh, versus what people were really concerned about uh, is the interests or the values or concerns that motivate them, the why. And I think I, I'm a mom, I have two kids. Uh, they're brilliant negotiators. Um, and particularly as little kids, they're always like, well, why, 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 right? Adults have to be a little bit more sophisticated than that, but you can ask, well, what is motivating you? Why do you value this? What are the health and safety or personal well-being concerns of not getting impacted by flooding? It doesn't take long to start to realize that um, you need access to basic things like electricity, power, food, water, transportation, but the larger economic development and livelihoods can be really important. What motivates people to care about something is a rich space that can open up a conversation much better than I need to build a dam or I want dynamite to blow up the bridge, which was actually a talking point from one of my elected officials in that basin for a long time. Um, there are lots and lots of wicked problems um, that really demand negotiation with a lot of stakeholders, and we're not very good at it. Uh, this is one of my favorite pictures of the United States. Uh, where somebody basically took uh, sort of the rivers and the waterways across the U.S. and made it look like veins and weighted it by the huck levels. Uh, what I love about this is you just don't see the boundaries of the states, but it also tells you what a transboundary set of questions something like water is. So let me give you a couple case studies and then um, a couple more thoughts and then I'll take questions here. So I'm going to walk through this a little bit quickly, but first case study is um, I was I and a colleague were mediating groundwater in Los Angeles. And I thought, oh, I've seen the movie Chinatown. I don't know how many of you have seen that movie. Um, parts of it are fictional and parts of it are a little close to home. And I'm thinking, you're sending me to Los Angeles? <laughs> I've seen Chinatown. What are you getting me into? Right? You know, two thirds of California's water is in Northern California when they had any water. Two thirds of the population is in Southern California. And you see the pumps in the center uh, that go over the Tehachapi's and drop water into Southern California through the canals, the bottom picture in the middle. And the canals are big. Yeah, this is an old, the bright picture here is, you know, 1920s police car in the bottom of the Los Angeles River. 
But getting into it, California, you know where California is. Central and West Coast basins, if you've flown into Los Angeles Airport, it's actually the head of a divide between two groundwater basins in the area. And when I was reading some of the background reports, it was to realize that there was so much fresh water, so much groundwater moving under that area, that in the late 1800s, there were reports of people dropping buckets off ships off Long Beach and finding fresh water. Uh, if you look at the place names, it's Artesia, it's Lakewood, Santa Fe Springs. LA, yeah, the LA River was kind of pathetic, but the groundwater was pretty significant. And so what you had is a ton of pumps going in, particularly in the 1930s and 40s, uh, and into the war effort, um, and they started to have a ton of saltwater intrusion coming back along the coastline, particularly, uh, again, where it basically says Pacific Ocean over here. They took each other to court um, in the 40s and 50s, 50s and 60s, sued each other. So there's two groundwater basin judgments in the area, and this predates California groundwater law by quite a bit. Um, the area is 420 uh, square miles, 43 cities, 4 million, 5 million people now. This is now a decade ago. Um, and they used about 635,000 acre feet of water per year in this area. An acre foot is uh, one acre, one foot deep. Used to be enough for a family of four for a year, and now people say it's enough for two or three families of uh, four for a year. We've gotten more efficient over time. Um, again, no groundwater code in California until 2014. It's a whole nother long conversation, but these basin by basin judgments at least gave us some sense of the parties that might be involved. Um, about 500 different parties, which is still a lot of people. Again, when I got sent down there by my colleague, he was like, go figure out who we should be mediating with. I'm like. Um, there's 4 million people in Los Angeles. Who do you want me to deal with? Working with some of the stakeholders, they're like, these judgments can be a formation way to deal with it. And what we're looking for is the legal certainty. If you put water in, can you take it out? What are the rules? Different way to think about it is, again, that they had basically determined that there was a technically figured out already that there was about 450,000 acre feet of water, a potential storage that was physically well below anything that would flood people's basements. It was about twice, a little bit, not quite twice of the existing pumping rights for the area. And by comparison, the Metropolitan Water District of, of Southern California was proposing a new reservoir at about $1.9 billion at that time. What did they think they could do? They thought in wet years they could take the water so that in dry years uh, they, could, they could basically balance the supplies. A different way of looking at it, when there was a lot of water flowing through the system, you'd dump it in the bucket, in the dry years you'd pull it out. Took us two and a half years of working with the parties to really think about this, but they actually reached a solution where they said, we've got a way again to make it clear for those who have the existing pumping rights that they could put it in, take it out and under what rules. So you see, uh, this is an editorial from I think 2012, 2013, um, republished in multiple of the local papers saying, hey, water is something uh, people really often fight about, but here we've actually found a solution for being able to move forward. Took them several years and several uh, sets of trips through the courts to actually implement this and bring the final players on board. But this is a system they're actually operating under right now in Southern California. Happy to go into more of the details, but just wanted to sketch this out. Second one that I'm going to sketch very quickly here is again flooding in the Chehalis River Basin of Washington State. This is 2007. This is a beautiful picture and it's absolutely also terrible. If you look very closely, this is actually Interstate 5 between Portland and Seattle in, in uh, <clears throat> December of 2007. They got about 18 inches of rain in 24 hours. There is no river basin anywhere in the world that can withstand that. And so what had been two towns, the highway and a river valley became a lake. Uh, and it lasted for a good five or six days before the water went down to huge amounts of damage, about $323 million worth of damage. Almost all the livestock in the area dead. Uh, and huge amounts of cost uh, in all sorts of different ways. I often think about the sense of, of conflict, a spiral kind of going up and causing quite a bit of consternation, right? A problem emerges, sides form, positions harden, communication stops, uh, resources are committed, the conflict goes outside the community and perceptions become distorted. This is from Carpenter and Kennedy. They have a fantastic book called Managing Public Disputes. It's a little bit dated, it's from 2001, but to me, it's still actually one of the more practical guides on how to have more constructive conversations. In the Chehalis, about three weeks after this flood, this is the picture on the front page of the New York Times. Anger and blame after the uh, deadly flood in the Northwest, areas of mudslide visible along recently logged slopes uh, in, 
in an area that drains into the Chehalis Basin. So you may look at this and say, well, it's your miserable logging practices that caused this flood. The answer is no, it's not what caused the flood. It may have made it worse, um, but certainly there was lots and lots of finger pointing in this area. It's an area that has had a history of flooding for 100 years, uh, where the Chehalis and uh, Centralia cities are is a flat area in the river, and it was always historically marshy, but they've had more recent bad floods. They joke, jokingly call themselves the Bermuda Triangle of the worst weather on the West Coast. Um, and so the anger and blame was also very local of your fault for this, your fault for that, your fault for this. And I was actually brought in, I was the third out of four facilitators uh, working in the area. And the question was, how do you really stop the flooding? Um, and their positionality was, we need to stop this flooding. It took us two years to set up a workshop to have a discussion about it. And while we were at that workshop, somebody said, there is not, there's simply not enough there's not a big enough umbrella that you could put out over this whole basin. We're asking the wrong question. Let's reframe this and think about how do we address the impacts of flooding? How do we address the other needs that might be going on? And somebody said, you know, we not only have a flooding problem, but we have a drought problem. We have the impact to the cities, but we have tribal questions. We have fisheries questions. And so it became actually counterintuitively a bigger set of questions. Not only how do we address flooding and reduce damage for flooding, but also address species concerns, drought as well. So by making the problem bigger, we are actually able to find more allies and move things forward. At the time um, they created the Chehalis River Basin Flood Authority, it's still quite active. Um, all of us have been in lots of meetings that look like this. Uh, but there was a lot of support for local process from then Governor Christine Gregoire, who said, look, I want to see a bottom up solution. I know that this has been intractable for decades. You go figure it out. Yes, I know I have the Oregon Truckers Association in Canada calling and saying, why can't you get the interstate freeway open? You figure out the local solutions. They put in money not only for projects, but for process, for facilitation, which is where someone like my role came in. We very much adapted this process over time and moved it around. Something like water and ecosystem restoration lends itself beautifully to tours. How do you get people out of a meeting room, go talk with people in different places, uh, create opportunities for workshops or uh, even friendly competition over who could serve the best snacks at different meetings made a difference. Lots of reinforcement for the local processes and a lot of other, um, not sure why this is cutting off, sorry, uh, but engagement of a lot of people, uh, decision makers, key stakeholders, and a lot of public outreach. Interestingly enough, when there was a lot of conflict, it was really easy to get the local paper to cover things. When things started to go better, we had to start writing our own op-eds. We had to write our own news because it was less fun for the local reporters to cover things are going well <laughs> than things are going poorly. And I keep that in mind when I read how much bad news there is out there. There's lots and lots of fantastic work that is happening behind the scenes. It's not often covered. Uh, so what you want a process to look like, you want to start, you want to work really hard together and find a really good outcome. I uh, sketched this out one day of this is really what processes look like. They go right up, down, left, all over the place. They're often messy. Uh, they're very rarely linear. Um, but again, you can make progress and people appreciate that progress. What's this look like from the headlines? You know, people feeling originally like they were frozen out of a new flood group to, oh, wow, we finally actually had a policy discussion that we wanted to be holding. When an unusual group of stakeholders out of that was able to walk into the state legislature and say, hey, we all agree that we need this. Washington's budget was no better than any other states, but they were able to leverage at that time $28.2 million for, again, both projects and process to move forward. Why? Because they were able to speak in a collective voice and say, here's the path that we are on. Not perfection, but a path. Um, you know, start to see headlines of this is a historic steps forward. Uh, and again, joining forces to really think about some of these different questions. Tons and tons of time spent talking and time spent creating time to talk. Uh, they created a, a colleague actually created an open. You can go look at all of their meeting notices, all of their meeting notes, all of their materials, very open and transparent. I mentioned tours already. <clears throat> we used a lot of ground rules about how to have constructive conversation, the use of consensus, which we had lots of discussion about that, and I'm happy to share more on that. Uh, a lot of effort really spent on the relationship of side of things. 
Uh, and again, my, my joke there is food really does help. A lot of time and effort to understand the issues, concerns, and fears. Uh, what was motivating people? We addressed a lot of issues as they really came up, uh, kind of one by one. And again, not always linearly. Lots of small successes led to more progress. Being able to address that uncertainty and unknowns, and we've already talked about active listening as being really, really important to this. Uh, hope is really critical, right? The narrative in the Shahila Basin is we can't do it. We hate each other and we've been fighting forever and we can't do this. But small successes allowed, and then again, you see an effort to really advertise what was happening. This is paid for by your taxpayer dollars. So you can see the sign, another Shahila Basin flood project. Because we needed to get out to the taxpayers that this was happening, good things were occurring to protect, for example, the airport. Um, and you started to see again a little bit more positive news about this of we finally see hope that real we're seeing real efforts to actually mitigate this. Uh, it led not only to uh, risk reduction, but also recognition. Um, in 2019, the Shahili Space and Flood Authority, again, which was one of the worst places in the world to work in flooding, won a national award for what they were doing. Pictured on the left was former um, County Commissioner Edna Fund, and she's saying, we're all working on these projects together and it's really gratifying. Or on the right, uh, former County Commissioner Ron Averill is like, these small projects, again, we're starting to see the value of them. Picture in the lower uh, far right is kind of the, it is peanut butter, it's across the basin, it's three counties, but lots of projects that are responsive to the local needs. The Shaneless Basin Strategy, uh, they actually built a part of the Washington State Department of Ecology that is now handling this day to day. And they've got now almost $50 million. Question is, has any of it worked? Uh, I was watching with a lot of concern and consternation this year in January in 2022, just this January, where they got nailed by a flood as big as the 2007 flood. And the question was, did, did all of this effort make a difference? And the answer is yes. I mentioned before the 2007 flood inflicted about $300 million worth of damage. The flood this year was 13 million. They lost almost no livestock across the basin. They developed actually an early warning system that had a huge amount of interaction with it. Um, they had built, one of the ideas that came up while I was working out there was the idea of somebody threw out in a meeting of, can we build critter pads? Everyone's like, well, what's a critter pad? It was effectively like, if you could build a pile of dirt an engineered pile of dirt that a cow or a livestock could walk up to the top of and self-rescue in a flood, you might ameliorate some of the livestock damages. So a huge number of critter pads across the area that actually allowed, again, one of those small projects that had big success. Um, upgraded pumps in some of the towns really did work. And one of the sewage treatment systems had actually been upgraded and withstood getting overtopped by the floodwaters, where another one that had not yet been upgraded actually did flood. Uh, so tons and tons of opportunities here that actually really made a difference for the community. The speed with which they were able to recover was quite a bit faster. Uh, so the work in this area on flooding has led to collaboration and other issues, education, transportation, and more. Why? Because they built these relationships between different people. Uh, one of those quotes caught my attention. This is from the local radio station from several years ago. I listened to to how people describe things is that I need this, this is for me. And what I was hearing was a switch from, from the I and me to we and our. Other communities in these three counties have, have been working with us. We will not forget. We're all in this together and being able to move forward and deal with catastrophic flooding. Uh, so just a couple more slides here. I also have thought a lot about this in terms of research. Um, Switching to the Penn State side of things have now been here, Andy mentioned, uh, 10 years and really been thinking about, well, how do we better, if engagement is workable, how do we better work with this? We're just finishing up a five-year project funded by the U.S. Department of Agriculture, looking at uh, the radical notion that you'd really want to engage with stakeholders on water and agriculture related questions. Um, we've worked in three states, Pennsylvania, Nebraska, and Arizona and five local leadership teams to say, what are the water and agriculture related questions that you're concerned about? Um, and first they were like, well, you're not here to tell us what to do. I'm like, no, we're here to listen and you're gonna tell us what's of concern. So in each of those five areas with local leadership teams, they've all gone in very different ways. 
but they've all basically said it was really helpful to have that local group to build the trust, identify the issues, and then work through it together to find solutions. Uh, if it's of interest, we're actually doing a final sort of project debrief phone call webinar, open webinar next week on the 10th from 1 to 3 p.m. Eastern, and I can circulate more information about that. Again, we're right at that wrap up and, and just distillation of a lot of information from this project. Another project that I'm working on uh, is also USDA funded uh, Sea Change Project, the Consortium for Cultivating Human and Naturally Regenerative Enterprises. That's a lot of words for basically saying, how do we start to stack the benefits of water quality, of energy, of uh, carbon markets? Can we develop, for example, um, more perennial grasses integrated with biorefineries and um, manure digesters to get a better product, renewable natural gas, for example, but to think about also protecting the environment and doing so very proactively. We're at the start of this project, it's been super interesting, very challenging to figure out how to break these pieces apart and say, is this a good idea or not? We're not presupposing the outcome, but we're moving to towards that. Uh, I mentioned, um, or Andy actually mentioned at the beginning, this is our smaller projects. Um, my class has been engaged with our local uh, Council of Governments to host a forum on climate action and adaptation. My students facilitated, this was during COVID um, last spring, but 150 people for an online engagement of what should we do about climate? And a lot of my students, I think, came away with that thinking, oh, I can really help foster this kind of conversation. Um, one other space that I've been working on and kind of intrigued by, again, I, I, I would say that there's still a valley of death here, is matching projects with funding. You know, on one hand, I hear a lot of I have a project and I need funding. The other space is I have funding, but I need good projects. And it's not a little bit of funding. It is a lot of funding globally, worldwide. The environment, sustain, environment social and governance space is really expanding. This is a snapshot, a little bit dated from 2020. Uh, but we're looking at 17 trillion assets, 17 trillion dollar assets at the start of 2020, um, and increasing quite rapidly of people looking to fund this space. And this is something I'm thinking a lot more about, which is certainly in Pennsylvania, we have a huge need for implementing projects and a huge need for money. How do we actually bridge that valley of death and get this accomplished? In the agriculture and <clears throat> Climate change space, you're seeing sustainable natural resources and ag in the top five categories uh, with a huge increase since 2018. So as I <clears throat> work on these types of questions and people, you know, again, there's a lot of frustration. <clears throat> Excuse me, um, but I, I give my students this as the golden rule, which is don't get mad and get curious and then really work together to find innovative solutions. Um, Yoda says, you know, fear is the path to the dark side. Fear leads to anger, anger leads to hate, and hate leads to suffering. How do we turn that around and work together to actually find solutions to this? And I think everyone has a secret superpower. I was in Sweden um, and, you know, someone like Greta Thunberg basically said, look, I'm so fed up with this. <laughs> I'm just going to sit down in front of parliament and strike. Mobilized a huge number of people. Um, I, in a fit of frustration, wrote this blog. Uh, it's been republished by the University of Utah to say, hey, you know, we in the dispute resolution world are not thinking enough about climate. Everybody needs to actually be engaging in this. And my own frustration led to that climate action and adaptation plan, stakeholder engagement. But asking questions, demanding and seeking answers and helping people really engage in effective processes, I think is a critical part of all the work that we're trying to do. If you want to read more about the blog, it's there. And with that, I'm going to stop. I thank you and appreciate any questions you guys might have. Okay, Laura, thanks very much. I'm going to invite people uh, to post questions in chat and go ahead and speak. Uh, Carol, you had posted something. Do you want to just ask that question? I don't know if you're able to unmute. What I have from Carol and Chad, if I can. Um, yeah, why don't you go ahead and read it? I don't know okay. if she's, she's still. Yeah, it is, uh, she, she notes that, yes, food helps. Uh, what is your take on progress, more progress or less during COVID when it's so hard to get people in the same room and offer food? Uh, I hate it. <laughs> it's the short answer. Um, it really, I think, does impact people's ability to engage. And there's been a lot of discussion amongst 
the facilitators um, and mediators of the world of how do we handle COVID. And I think everybody agreed that if you had an existing group of people that already knew each other, it was easier to switch to the online world and have productive engagement. But a lot of us were then like, okay, how do you start new discussions and new types of engagement? And so there's there's actually quite a few now very effective resources about how to more effectively use, for example, Zoom or WebEx to have constructive engagements and build those relationships. It takes a different kind of work to set it up and to, to really foster it, but I think something has significantly been lost over the last couple of years with that isolation. I also think now coming back out of COVID as much as people are coming out of it, people are coming with very different comfort levels um, and it's also not easy. I think we've forgotten what social skills we have collectively um, a little bit in terms of engaging with each other in groups. And so again, as a facilitator, a mediator, I'm spending a lot of time thinking about how do you almost reintroduce people to the idea of being near each other? Um, I've done a lot of work with my students, even during COVID at going out and working, for example, I'm, I'm the local steward for our local buffer, riparian buffer. And I got a lot of students out just pulling weeds and they were so excited to be outside and engaging with people that they, and they kept coming back. They were like, can we come pull weeds next weekend? I'm like, uh, don't you have work to do? They're like, no, 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 we really, but like, this is, this is a really a good opportunity for us to break those barriers down. And for me, that was really, I think, eye opening of how much there was that hunger for human engagement. So we've done, we're actually hosting on Saturday. Um, and it's raining pretty hard in Pennsylvania right now. So I'm hoping that our flood resilience fest, which is literally a big tent next to the Susquehanna River to talk about community resilience is not flooded now by the Susquehanna. Uh, but we've had people coming out of the woodwork to say, can, can, I, can I come share information? I wanna be there. So I think sometimes it's opening up the opportunity and a big tent like that was easy because we were like, okay, we're outside and we can finesse the COVID situation a little bit. Uh, free food, we're working with local vendors and just trying to get people out to come talk with us about flooding and flood resilience. So uh, the long and short is COVID has been hard and there's opportunities, I think, for bridging and finessing that space. I'll also say that in some of the engagements, um, I mentioned the Water for Ag project and our local leadership team. In Arizona, for example, we had somebody who had historically been very quiet get much more engaged when they switched to the online world. She was more comfortable with it. So it changed who was engaging and how they were engaging in ways that were fascinating actually to see. So I'm gonna go ahead and go to Maggie with the next question. Sure, hi, uh, Lara, thank you so much. This is um, this is wonderful to, to hear about your work and uh, reflects a lot of what I try to teach and engage with students in the in my natural resource management class, um, and uh, and it's it's inspiring to see how you've involved um, your students so much in the process. So that's that's wonderful. Um, I was just yeah, I just had a question about stakeholders and sort of thinking about your process from the very beginning. Um, what are some steps you take or or tips or strategies you have? Um, to ensure that the stakeholders that arrive at the table are ones who also that, that that full representation is there, right? That maybe the the voices that are missing are ones that you really um, you know that haven't heard about it, and and how do you reach out to those voices, or what 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 do you do to sort of ensure full representation? Yeah, I mean, usually as a mediator or facilitator, somebody else has has more or less said, "Look, we need some help having a conversation." And again, you know, there's a range, there's a range. Facilitation, I, I tend to think things are a little less in the conflict zone. If someone's hiring a mediator, they probably have an issue that they're, you know, that there is actually a pretty significant conflict. But I turn to those parties and say, okay, who should I be talking to? And, you know, using a classic social science technique, right? A snowball interview, I may talk to you. You may say, talk to these other three people. I talk to those other three people. They say, talk to these five more people. You keep going until you run out of people to talk with. I, I do not like to walk into a room and facilitate a meeting if I can help it because I don't know what's going on. But if I can talk to people beforehand, you can often get a sense of that. That said, you know, that's one way to figure that out. Another question, though, that I've been spending a lot of time thinking about is who's not usually in the room, right? Um, people jokingly said, look, a lot of us are professional meeting goers. We're paid to go to meetings. 
who's not. Uh, I have a friend and colleague who's working in Los Angeles and trying to think about uh, the homeless population. Well, you know, someone who's homeless is not going to walk into a meeting setting and sit down and, and discuss policy. They're just not. Um, right? Same thing with the environment, environmental justice and the uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion questions. Hey, you felt historically disenfranchised for these conversations. Why don't you come into my setting and have a conversation? Eh, not going to work, right? And so who are the trusted intermediaries who may be working with that group? Can you go to them? Can you go to their space? Uh, one of my all-time favorite meetings on flooding in the Chehalis was at a very, very tiny Grange Hall, way in the far back part of the basin, to sit down and have a conversation over cookies and punch to say, what do you guys think the flooding issues are? Um, so it was us going to them versus us asking them for us. Let's see, us going out to them versus saying, you need to come to us. Uh, and being pretty proactive, something like a tour was non-threatening way for people to kind of be like, yeah, I'm kind of curious and I can tag along, right? Um, heard another set of colleagues talking about uh, a pretty fraught situation with climate adaptation along the North Carolina um, islands. And they started actually not by talking about anything substantive, but doing communal cooking classes together to share culture, share food, and then start to figure out those engagements. So key points for me, Think really broadly about who may be a stakeholder, figure out who's comfortable coming into a room, whatever that may look like, and who are the trusted intermediaries that may help you reach the groups that are not comfortable? How do you engage with them in that space? Okay, uh, I'm gonna turn to Anisha next. Thanks, Dr. Fowler, for such an interesting talk. Um, I was just curious about the stakeholders during your negotiations, and I was wondering if they're easily convinced that you are neutral and lack a conflict of interest. Uh, no, short answer is no. People are highly skeptical of it. And, you know, the, the challenge that one has, right, is uh, do, do you have enough substantive knowledge to be able to speak? I'd much rather actually facilitate a discussion where I actually understand the lingo and I, as a, a again, neutral third party can help translate. Um, I've facilitated some discussions at Penn State um, with our Institute for Computational and Data Science, and I'm always like, oh, you guys are speaking language I don't understand, right? And so some of it is a competency. Do you understand what's going on? But the challenge is if you understand, then people may see you as not neutral. And so a lot of what I have to do is actually you have to build that rapport that people decide I'm going to share some information and then I'm going to see what you do with it. If I'm acting as a mediator, right, there's literally a mediation privilege that's like an attorney client privilege, but they have to decide that I'm actually going to withhold that information that they shared. So I often feel like I'm wearing an invisibility cloak as a mediator, right? Somebody has to tell me something. I hear it. But I don't get to turn around and say, hey, Andy, let me tell you what so-and-so said. <laughs> My piece of advice is if you're ever in a mediated setting, listen really hard for the questions that a mediator or a facilitator may be asking, because they're asking them for a reason. So my tool of the trade, again, is questions. Andy, you just said this. Can you tell me more about that? What about this? Have you ever thought about? Have you considered this? Yes, I see this part of the court case, but have you read the next sentence? Right? Why am I asking that? I'm asking it from a place of having talked with probably a lot of people, but I'm not, I come from a facilitative perspective. I'm gonna facilitate you coming and moving forward. Other people come from a much more evaluative place. Again, if you're gonna hire a mediator, you wanna know what kind of mediator they are. There are differences, um, but people have to decide to trust. And as they do so, it opens up that space to have more rich conversations. Do you have to be a mediator or facilitator to have more effective conversations? No, right? If you, so I got my start um, working for the Oregon Water Resources Department when I was 22. And I got tossed into the deep end of all sorts of really difficult situations. I was young, I was female, I didn't have a lot of experience. They were like, hey, Lara, go figure this out. It's been an issue for 10 years, go sort it out. Like, I don't know what I'm doing. But I think it could could open up those conversations and learn little piece by piece about how to help foster those more constructive conversations. 
You could be sitting in a meeting even today, and I call it a little bit steering from behind. Maybe your meeting isn't really particularly going anywhere, but you can be like, you know, I think there's three things we're trying to talk about today. It, am I understanding that we want to talk about A, B, and C? And probably everyone else is like, oh, thank God somebody's thinking about what agenda it is. Yes, those are the three issues, and then you can work through. Uh, my other secret tool is a piece of paper and a pencil. As I'm writing, listening to a discussion, you know, it may be that I'm like, oh, Maggie said this, and Matthew said that, and Anisha said this. I'm writing that down because later I can come back and be like, these are the three things that we covered. Did I understand that right? You all will be like, wow, she's brilliant. I'm like, no, I'm not brilliant. I wrote it down because I can't remember everything that's going on in a conversation. But it can be a way to take a, a conversation that's off the rails a little bit, give an agenda, work through it, and then recap it. And people will think you're a brilliant facilitator. Um, but there's ways, small ways, again, that you build that credibility where then people look to you. Andy's seen me do this with Stack all the time, Chesapeake Bay Scientific and Technical Advisory Committee. It's not magic. It's just trying to track it and reflect back. Um, and then people build that trust and decide actually you can wear that neutrality, if you will. It's I just have to interject and say, um, it's not magic, but Laura is a brilliant facilitator. So just want to put that out there. <laughs> um, okay, uh, Matt Fagan. All right, this is a great talk. And I found that those who take notes to do recap tend to direct the conversation, especially when you're talking among multiple scientists. So it's fascinating to hear that facilitators use that formally. Um, so I'm also, I, I find it really interesting, this idea where you found additional problems to kind of help build community about problem solving. And I like the saying, when you have a problem, you have a problem. When you have two problems, sometimes they solve each other. And how often do you use that technique to sort of use the existence of multiple problems that might bind people together and help resolve social local conflicts? More often than you'd think. Um, and, and weird stuff, right? Like while I was down in Los Angeles, I was interviewing a whole bunch of people, like what are the problems that people are dealing with? And 15 people I interviewed with said term limits. I was like, what? I'm here to talk to you about water issues and you're talking about term limits. Why? Because in California, when they enacted term limits, you had a whole bunch of people who worked in the water world. They called them the water buffaloes. They'd been there forever. They'd been the same three old white guys who'd been running these water districts for 30 years. Term limits came in and you needed a place to either gain political experience or a place to go afterwards. Small known fact, if you serve on a water board in, in California, you get paid to go to meetings and you get insurance benefits. Who wouldn't want to serve on a water board? Term limits come in and they become much more diverse. Good thing, but it also shifted who was in there. So it made a really big difference. Never would have thought to ask about that, but by asking and listening, I could then think about the political dynamic of how the water world played out. Um, but often I'm actually looking for what are the other issues that are also driving so we're dealing with flooding in, in uh, Susquehanna and with a community and, you know, flooding is, is an issue, but so is recreation. And so is economic development. And I don't mind when the problem becomes a little bit bigger because that opens up other pots of money. It opens up other players who might be interested and it weaves potentially a more interesting solution set uh, that can actually be implemented. And it's one of the reasons I was a reluctant lawyer. I didn't go to law school to be a lawyer and I resent the court system quite a bit because it tells you you win, you lose, but you lost the creativity of finding some of these solutions. One of the last projects I worked on before we moved from uh, the West Coast was a small food fight between Northern and Southern California over water allocation. They were ordered to mediation. They were really fussy about being there. They did not want to come to mediation, but I'll never forget the meeting where they got out of the we don't want to be here too. We could do this. We could do that. What about this? Right? Walls papered with ideas and it opened up a space for much more creative problem solving. And afterwards talking with, it was lawyered, it was layered three or four layers deep with lawyers, very expensive process, but the outcome from it prevented years of court battles, got them to an implementation that was far more creative and they implemented it without a lot of fighting, right? That's to some extent priceless, but they made the problem bigger and then was able to solve it and work with those creative solutions to find that answer. So again, it seems totally counterintuitive. Like we already got a big problem. Why would you make it worse? 
a lot of our problems are system problems. And if you can think about that system as a whole, sometimes you can find a solution. Thank so, you. Jamie, I wonder if, if getting rid of pork in Congress was a way, was, was a worse idea to sit, you know, less corruption, but now we can't trade off as well. Mm -hmm. um, it's back. <laughs> Finally, Jamie, you had a comment. Did you want to say something or did you just want to make that observation? I don't know if there was a question there. I don't know if Jamie's still with us. Jamie? Um, oh, hi, sorry. <laughs> I had to navigate back to my, uh, out of the chat. Um, no, I, I just thought it was really in interesting conversation. I'm always kind of talking to different groups, considering different stakeholders, trying to understand different perspectives. So it was just, and uh, like I've done a little water work myself. So I was just like, wow, this is, this is so interesting. Um, so that's, that's all I had to say. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. And what I would say is, you know, if this is intriguing to you, right? I really, there's there's local mediation groups in lots of places. You don't have to be a lawyer to take mediation training. A lot of the training is focused on family law, but again, sometimes I feel like the environment and natural resource world is very much like families, right? It's a small, small space and to some extent, but there's tons of skill training out there. And I just, I, I finally, at one point I was like, do I go back and get a degree in hydrology? I'm like, yeah, I could do that. But what I really love doing is working with people and find helping people find solutions. Um, the other thing I would say is all the big projects I've ever worked on, it's a person or two who says, you know what? I don't know the answer. There's got to be a better way. You know, Andy, can you and I have a sit down and have a cup of coffee and think through what this better way might be? Every single big process has come from a couple people thinking, I got to find a different way through. Uh, last year at workshop, somebody said, we can only move at the speed of trust. And what's it take to foster and build that trust to me is so incredibly important as we're working with any number of really hard and challenging questions. How do we take people out of yelling at each other across screens or social media and go out together to solve common problems? To me, that's, I think, Again, how I kind of hold my own frustrations and fears about the world and check and say, okay, I know what this looks like. If I have to, I'm going to go pull weeds with a bunch of grad students. And that's going to lead to a longer conversation about X, X, Y, and Z. And what can we do with that? Sometimes it's starting really small and very practically, and sometimes it's much bigger. Um, but I think in there, there's a lot of solution space. So it's a real encouragement. You, you don't have to be a mediator or a facilitator to do this. We can all do this in our daily life. Um, you know, and it can be the brave person who says, I don't know the answer, but there's got to be a different way. So, I'm going to uh, ask a question. Laura, can you stick around for a couple more minutes to, to, yeah. to do this? Because I actually want to hear your answer and get it on tape. <laughs> um, I, I'm going to go more global, okay? Because one of the things that really fascinated me when you were talking about the Chihalas example was, this seemed like it was going to be intractable, and somehow it managed not to be. Which leads me wonder um, what is tractable and what's not tractable. But I just want to throw this out. Um, I've been listening to the audiobook of uh, the Ministry for the Future. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, have you read that book by any chance? So, mm -hmm. um, so you know what it's about, though. It's basically, you know, it's about climate change, and it's actually Kim Stanley Robinson's way of trying to walk you through what are the problems. It opens with a heat wave that kills 20 million people in India, which is very reminiscent of what the wet headlines have been this week, actually pretty scarily. Yeah. And it goes on from there, but it's actually, I haven't gotten all the way through it yet, but it's mostly a very optimistic book, but I've been amazed at how much of the book is about negotiation, mm -hmm. you know, creating uh, solutions to problems. Um, and uh, that that point you made about hope is, is, is really fascinating, but like, how do you decide, or do you just not figure out, you just keep plowing ahead until something happens? Whether a problem can actually, you know, are, are there problems you run up against that you just say, you look at it and say, nothing we can do here? Um, or is there always something you can do? I guess my reaction, my personal reaction is there's almost always something we can do. And my husband was, my husband who's a geographer was actually laughing at me the other day. He's like, you've never met something that you haven't figured out that there's some way to, to shift or shape in some way. 
I, you know, globally, if somebody said, I don't know how to actually tackle climate change, you know, tackle climate change from a global perspective, like that's hard. Although one of the TED talks, my favorite TED talks that's out there is Christiana Figueres, uh, who was the lead negotiator um, for the Paris climate talks. She gave a talk that says, what gives me hope? Climate change gives me talk. I was like, what? <laughs> really? She says, because we're seeing a pace of acceleration of change that we've never seen before. Um, what gives me hope, I think, is is I love working at a watershed scale, and I don't know how to solve the Mississippi as a whole, but I can solve and work with people in Spring Creek or even in the Susquehanna as we're thinking about flooding questions. And I'm constantly pestering people on flooding questions to think about water quality and on water quality to think about flooding because those worlds, they're not talking very often, and yet they're tied. Um, so. I often feel like part of my job is connector slash translator slash have you talked to so and so? Can we again by bringing these problems together find a solution that we may not have seen? Um, something like acid mine drainage in Pennsylvania is a really big question. Well, it turns out there's a lot of rare earth minerals in acid mine drainage. Can we start to mine that and harvest that for our renewable energy future and address the water quality concerns? I've just tied three problems together and between them, we might actually, you know, be able to find a path forward complicated, but interesting. Right? So, where are those, you know, a colleague said, show me your problem and I'll show you your solution. How do you turn those around and go from, I don't want to do this to don't do this to what can we do with this? And that's a creative space where you often will have people who are pretty weary of having the same conversation and the same fights get very like, oh, I can think of this or. It, it's just a much more hopeful and interesting and engaging space where those solutions are happening. Catherine Hayhoe wrote a book um, about climate change. She's the uh, head scientist for the Nature Conservancy. Fantastic, fantastic and very hopeful person about climate. And when I was reading her book, I was like, this looks like negotiation and mediation. Um, you know, so there's lots of resources out there um, of people who have been able to take what seem like intractable problems and start to move them forward. Meeting people where they are is a good start. Well, all I'm going to say in response to that is that I've been feeling pretty hopeless this week, given everything in the news. So this is the most hopeful thing I've heard lately. I want to thank you for uh, for this presentation. Um, okay, um, unless somebody has any last comments, I think we are going to bring it to a close. And I will put out an, an in, in, uh, a link uh, for anybody who wants to uh, watch this later if they didn't get a chance to watch it or or what have you, but thanks so much, Laura. Um, really, really, really good talk. We really appreciate it. Yeah, very happy to, to come and I just I just tossed my email in chat. Um, so happy to share resources. Um, I curate my favorite hopeful resources. <laughs> I'm very happy to share. Um, I can't read the doom and gloom. I live it. And so I've, I'm always seeking out <laughs> the, okay, how are people finding ways forward in this space? Um, and can offer up um, what I found again that is helpful in moving forward. But appreciate the time, pre pe appreciate people's interest, and uh, um, go find a local question and dig into it. All right, thanks. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording now. Recording is stopped. <laughs>